we're live streaming this too, so I just got to get that thing kicked off, and then we'll be good to go. Okay, it looks like it's it's going. So, um, hi everyone. Hi. My name is Dale. Dale Spoonmore. Uh, my wife and I are the creators. Hey, it worked. Of uh, of this app that we'll be showing today and talking about. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about where we started and what led to us making the app because neither one of us had any experience doing this before three years ago. In fact, this was our yard three years ago. Um, we'd never grown anything in our lives, um, but I have a bit of an obsessive personality, I guess you could say, and this became my thing. And um, I, I basically dedicated all of my time to learning everything I could about how to grow food. And, and everything we learned through building this went into our app. So, yes. Is this your backyard? This is my backyard. Uh -huh. Yeah, then, then this is what led to us making the app was the process of building this. You know, I um, I was having to memorize all these things and look this stuff up constantly, and, and I wanted a place to, to have it in a mobile app. And I've been in software development my, my whole career, so it's just it's the thing I wanted to make. So, um, yeah, that's a, just a brief introduction to who we are. I'm going to switch over and show you guys. Uh, the app now and use it to drive the rest of this. So, um, one second. Okay, so can you all see? All right, so this is our app here. And that's, that's why I said if, if you download the app, it might be easier to, to follow along as, as we go. But I'm going to use this to kind of drive because we have a tab in here that talks about how to get started growing food. So I'm going to use this as we go and, and kind of go through the, the format of this class is, is hopefully you will come away from, from this with an understanding of how you can start growing food in your backyard. And we basically took everything we learned through the process of building that and put it into this presentation and into this app. So um, to start off the, the first step and also feel free to reach out and if you have any questions, just yell at me or raise your hand or whatever to get my attention. Um, feel free to interrupt me as, as often as you like. So um, the first step to growing food is to choose the right location. And this is something that I did not do a very good job of, a job of in the beginning. Um, I had a fence, you can see here, this fence that I have up here, um, that casts a shadow on the north side of it, but the shadow was not cast during the summer when I built those beds. So I didn't think about the, how the sun and how it works whenever I built the garden. And, and that was a mistake I made. So that's something you really want to think through. You want to think about where the sun is through different months. You know, in March, it's going to be a different place than it's going to be in August. Um, in June, like the, the sun moves north and south throughout the year. So you want to, um, you want to think about that and, and make sure that, that your beds are in a place where they get sun. But on the other hand, it's not necessarily a good thing to have too much sun in Oklahoma. So especially in the summer, we get really, really hot summers here. And if you have a bed that's out in the full sun all day long, it's gonna get baked. So if you have um, an area on, on the east side of your house that's, that's protected um, from the sun in the afternoon, like that's, that's a great place to grow things. Or if you can, you can build shade walls where you just have T-posts and you stick them in the ground, you attach shade cloth to attach them. That's another way that you can, um, you, you can have shade and things like that in your, in your yard. So, so anyway, that's, that's the first thing that you really wanna think about is location and you wanna find the right spots to plant in. Um, one other thing you definitely want to want to want to you're gonna have to deal with in Oklahoma more than likely is, is Bermuda grass. So I know I did. You can see my whole yard was just Bermuda when we started, and Bermuda is a nightmare to deal with. That black weed cloth fabric, the Bermuda goes right through it, and it doesn't it doesn't work to keep it from keep it out at all. The cardboard. Uh, so so we end up switching to cardboard because that works way better. So if you cover all the grass with cardboard and then you cover that with a foot of wood chips, then that'll smother out the Bermuda grass and that'll keep it from growing. And then uh, as the cardboard begins to break down and as the wood chips begin to break down, then worms come up and then they start to help break that stuff down. And you, and you end up with a really good environment to grow directly in the ground. So what, when we start, we take all of our raised beds. Or we, we, so we, we, lay, we're sorry, we, we laid out the cardboard, then we laid out the wood chips and then we scooted away the, card, or the wood chips and we built raised beds every so often. And then we planted in that. And I'll talk about what we put in that here in a minute. But now we're starting to plant directly in those areas that, had, that have just had cardboard and wood chips for a few years because that's all broken down. It's really good soil. And we're planting perennial stuff that comes back year after year in there. So another thing you want to think about is convenience. You want to have your gardens to where they're pretty close to the house. If they're way out away from the house, then uh, they're going to be uh, out of sight, out, out of mind. Also, if you have any trees or anything like that, you want to plant too close to them. And if you have an area in your yard that floods, that's not a good place to have a garden either. 
Um, if you do a raised bed or some of the, the other stuff I'll, I'll be talking about here in, in, a, in a bit, then perhaps you could do it in that kind of area, but otherwise you don't want to, you don't want to grow. And I'm not going to talk that much about growing directly in the ground because I don't do, I mean, aside from what I mentioned about the planting and the wood chip thing, I'm not going to be talking much about planting directly in the, in the ground because once you start doing that, there's a lot more work that goes into it, more work than most people want to spend on this type of thing, more work than I wanted to spend in the beginning. So it's not what I recommend. So I recommend building either a raised bed or um, using a smart pot that we'll be giving away and talking about today and then filling that with a soil mix. So, and, and that leads us into the next step, which is uh, to either build raised beds, which are the wooden boxes you saw the picture of earlier, was, they're real simple to build, um, or the smart pots that we're giving away today are a really great option as well. So these are fabric raised beds that you can, you can unfold and then they're just, you just fill this with potting soil. So this can be on a patio or, or anywhere and they're a really great way to get started with growing. Um, there's some advantage of these too because with typical containers, whenever the roots hit the side, they start circling and then they become useless. Well, with these, when the roots hit the side, they stop and they form little capillaries where they can still absorb oxygen. And it makes it to where they're able to get more oxygen to the roots than typical because they're able to get oxygen from the side and from the plant. So um, I'm a really big believer in these. I was using them for a number of years before they came on board to help sponsor us. So uh, we're, we're big fans of them and they're a great way to get started. We, in, in the app, we have links to buy them. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yes, question. How long do they last? They said they will last eight to 10 years. I've had mine for going on three now, I think, and they look great. So um, they do recommend bringing them in the winter and stuff like that. I don't do any of that. I leave them out. I grow all winter long. I grow spinach and kale even over the winter. So, so I use mine year round um, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of them. And also the smaller sizes you can bring indoors. So if you have a tomato or something like that, you could push that tomato all the way through the winter indoors. and technically they're perennials if you're in the right, you know, uh, climate. So, um, so yeah, the, I'm a big, big fan of those. Um, we have links to them in our app. So if you go, what's that? Uh, this is the, well, they actually have bigger than this. This is the bigger of like the consumer size, but I have one that's the size of a swimming pool. That's like, you know, uh, and I don't know, someone sent it to me and I don't know, I don't know how much it would cost to actually buy that size. They also have a horse trough size that's like, two feet by eight to 10 feet and about two feet tall. That's great for sweet potatoes and potatoes. So they have all sorts of different sizes and I'll be adding more into the app. We, we have a direct partnership with them we're working on now to we're gonna sell things directly through the app instead of through Amazon like we do now. And they're our first vendor that we're working with. So we're building in a lot of integrations and also things like showing you which vegetable goes with the right smart pot and you know, like recommending the right one for each size and making it really easy so you don't have to think at all you know, about how, how to do this. So uh, we're, we're big fans of these. They've got all these different sizes and you'll see more as we go through the app about that. As far as raised beds are concerned, um, they're really simple. You don't have to worry about, you know, um, there's a lot of concern about whether you use treated wood or, or non-treated wood. The, really the debate from that stems from things they did in the 70s. You know, they used to treat wood with really bad stuff that we don't use anymore to treat wood. They treat wood mostly now with copper sulfate, it's copper. Uh, copper is a thing you spray on your plants to help with fungus, so it's already something we're using in the garden, so it shouldn't hurt anything. I've done a lot of research on this. The editor of the Organic Gardening Magazine is the one I based this opinion off of, off of his writings. So, um, so anyway, uh, if you are worried about it, or if you want to preserve the wood longer, you can line the inside of it with plastic lining. I've done that just to help the wood last a little bit longer. Um, so yeah, and we have guides on our website that show how to, how to do all this as well. And we have videos that show all this in detail. So if you go on our website, you can see uh, see all that stuff as well. Yes, if question. If you don't mine the wood, how long does the last? I don't know. I, I mean, I've only been doing this for three years. So I mean, just from personal experience, mine still looks fine. But I think that 10 year mark, I think for most everything, like the smart pots for the raised beds, I've got like seven to eight to 10, like, you know, and it, it depends on a lot of factors too. So, you know, how, if they're out in the sun or if they're shaded or if I, I painted the outside of mine too to hopefully help. I painted them all white, you know, just to kind of help and we'll see if it works. Well, I mean, I was on a budget. So when, when I started and I don't build, I don't do raised beds anymore um, just because I like the smart pot. I think the smart pots are more convenient and I have a lot of area that I'm planting directly in the ground just because it's broken down over time. Um, but my strategy was I just went to the big box store and I bought the cheapest treated wood I could find. Um, you could, you could buy cedar and then it's not treated and it'll last a lot longer. 
but it's going to cost more. And I, when we started all this, I didn't know we were going to get to the scale we're at now. You know, it was just um, so. So anyway, that, that's that's the way we did it. But if you if you if you know it's going to be for there for a long time, buy cedar. Another thing, if you want to save some money, uh, we've actually built raised beds out of pallets that we've taken apart. So just get it. now make sure they're heat treated. Um, there's a little stamp on it that says HT. And then you know it wasn't treated with arsenic or anything like that because a lot of those pallets are um, wood that comes from China that's treated that's not up to our standards and then it's kind of it's it has a lot of stuff involved in there you don't want to mess with but but if it says HT on it then it's fine and there's a lot of cedar uh, pallets out there too that I've seen floating around so so those are some economical ways to build raised beds too I want to make sure that I uh, turn the audio on because I have a bad habit I did okay you don't know how many times I've done videos where I do the whole thing with no audio. <laughs> it's a terrible feeling. <laughs> so the next step is to, once you have your raised bed or your container, to fill it with a soil mix. So uh, you can buy just potting soil. That's, I've never done that. It's a very expensive way to do it. Um, those bags of potting soil are at least 10 bucks for the good stuff each. Um, I make my own, and I make it with a combination of these three ingredients. So this is vermiculite, peat moss, and compost. Vermiculite is a rock that's mined out of the ground and then it's, it's exploded. The point of it is it absorbs things really well. It's almost like a popcorn texture. If you've seen potting soil with the little white flakes in it, that's either vermiculite or perlite. And you can substitute perlite for vermiculite if you'd like. Um, peat moss is the second ingredient and you can also substitute coconut core instead, um, instead of peat moss if you like. Um, again, it doesn't provide any nutrients to the plant. It's just a growing medium to help store water and nutrients and things like that. And then the compost is where, is where the important stuff is because that's where the plants get their food. Um, for compost here locally in Oklahoma, I go to Minic Materials and they have three different types of compost and I get a little bit of each. Um, and then I also get some compost from Markham's Nursery. They have a red bud compost that's really good. Um, and then any other place that I find, uh, Commonwealth Urban Farms is going to start selling compost soon, and it looks incredible. So I'll definitely, you know, get some from them. But the point is, is to get compost from as many sources as you can, and then combine them together. Yes, a question. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Norman has a free compost facility. Don't go there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Because I, I didn't even think this is people's lawn stuff. They yes, exactly. Their lawns with all kinds of stuff, and I had very deformed. Plants. Same thing happened to me. I'm glad you mentioned that. So that's that's one thing that, you know with the compost that it's important that it's high quality compost, and it's also important that the first time you start buying from somewhere that you test it. I have a video that shows in detail how you test compost, but just a brief like 30 second synopsis of it is you take half of the new compost and you mix it with potting soil, and then you have potting soil, and you have like little containers of each, and then you plant peas in all of them, and you watch them grow. And after about three weeks, if those peas are deformed at all, then you know there's an issue. If they're fine, you know there's not. Uh, there's not a faster test that doesn't cost thousands of dollars, and I, I wish there was, because my first year, I poisoned my whole garden with compost that I can't say definitively that it was Norman that bit me, because I was making my own compost too, and I was using horse manure. And I've since learned that horses uh, often graze on fields that are sprayed with uh, herbicides that last up to three years in the soil. And what was happening was the herbicide was going right through the horse into its manure. And then that I was making my compost out of and all my tomatoes died on me. And it took me going to the head of soil science for OSU to figure out what had happened. And my heart sunk when I figured it out. Um, so it's something you don't want to deal with because it's hard to get rid of. I had to give my gardens, my raised bed baths every, almost every other day for a couple months. And then I grew nothing but mustard and then turned it under because there's chemicals and mustard. That, like all the stuff I had to go through. Avoid all of that by testing. And then, I mean, I feel safe about Minic and about Markham's because I've used both of those for two or three years. I've talked to a lot of people that use their stuff. I've talked to the people that make it and they care about what goes in it. You know, like, um, but if you're buying from anywhere else, that's just, you know, Make sure you test it or, or be careful with it. Now you can make it yourself too. Um, it's really simple to make. To make it ourselves, I, I basically just take uh, wood chips, uh, coffee grounds you can get in bulk from like Starbucks even. We'll have bags of coffee grounds you can throw in there, autumn leaves. Um, I don't really put food scraps or anything like that in there because I have a worm bin and the worms are more efficient at breaking that stuff down and I don't have to deal with as many pest issues because the worm bin is indoors and all of that. So um, you can take all these bulk ingredients and put it in a compost pile and make it yourself. And again, I have guides on my website and videos and through the app you can find that, 
it, like show all this in detail. I'm out there in my garden all day doing this. Like, look, the, you know, like that's all I do. So I, I get to work from home, and that's basically how I spend half my day is doing that kind of thing. So, um, so I think I pretty much covered everything about the mix. And basically, what you do is you just mix all three of those together. Yes, question. Go ahead. Uh, are you on barrel, composting? barrel composting, like the ones that are up in the air. Um, I guess you know, I, I've never had success with it and once I learned more about how composting works and how plants work I don't really understand how they're ever successful because composting involves microbes right I guess if you get the microbes into there then you could get a system going but that sounds like extra work whereas if I just do it directly on the ground well, there's all these microbes in the ground they're just gonna flock to it and I just gotta have a pile on the ground. But now if I have it up off the ground, now I've gotta introduce microbes in, I've gotta keep it the right temperature, the right moisture, or else I'll kill all the microbes. Like, but if it's just on the ground, then I know that if I mess up, they're just gonna go somewhere else and they'll come back whenever it's good for them again. Because I'm, believe it or not, I'm a terrible gardener. Um, I don't trellis my tomatoes as I'm supposed to. I forget to do things all the time. That's why I built an app to make it easier for me. And that's why I built automation with my irrigation to make it easier for me. Because if it's left to my own devices to remember to do something, two days are going to go by and I'm going to forget. And that's just I know myself. So that, that's, why, that's why I built this. So the next step, um, once you have it filled with soil, is the fun part. You get to start planting. And this is where I want to talk about a couple different methods. So we started with the square foot gardening method. And we used this. Um, to help with it in the beginning. And, and my kids still use these a lot. My two-year-old is learning how to count with this, actually, and her colors. This thing is awesome for that. Um, but the thing that this does is it helps you with spacing. So if you go to any vegetable in the app, and this is the first time I've shown this screen, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. This is our growing guide section, where you can choose whatever you want to grow. I'm going to start with beans. And then once you click on it, it gives you a little summary at the top. It gives you exact dates for when you can plant based on where you live. It uses data from the nearest weather station to calculate the right times for you. Um, and then down here, it gives you the number per square. So that's what this means, is how many seeds or how many plants you put in per square foot. Um, so this makes it really easy to get going. This was developed um, by someone else, the Square Foot Gardening Method. There's a book called Square Foot Gardening Method. I really recommend it. It's the first book I started with. I will warn you, it was not written by someone from Oklahoma and he did not have to deal with our kind of conditions. So there are some things that I don't necessarily do the same way that he recommends. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to those. It's, ma it's mainly with tomatoes. So if I don't remember, I have a video that outlines all this and it's about tomatoes. So um, I'm gonna jump back over here and I'll show this more here in a bit. So there's two different ways to start different foods. It's basically from seed or from transplant. The good news is, is most everything can be started just directly from seed. The only things that I actually have to start from transplant um, or buy at a nursery and transplant in are cabbage, broccoli, tomatoes, and peppers. Now, if I grew cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, I'd have to do those too, but that's it. Everything else can be started directly from seed for the most part. There are, there are some herbs that you've got to propagate through cuttings and stuff, but as far as like vegetables and fruits are concerned, um, those are all started, you know, from seed. And Ted, yes, go ahead. Question. Asparagus. Asparagus is actually started from a crown, so it's propagated from taking that crown and putting it. So it's not technically a seed or I guess it's a transplant. I guess it's almost like the way you would do garlic in, in a way. Um, so, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The, so. Um, The reason why you have to start broccoli and cabbage and tomatoes and peppers indoors is because their growing life is long enough that if we started them outdoors basically now would be the first time we'd be able to, then we're not going to have anything until fall. Technically you could do it. You could go put tomato and pepper seeds in the ground now and you'll have them in fall. But peppers and tomatoes and really anything that produces fruit uh, does not produce fruit once the temperatures get above 90. Um, about 95-ish because the flowers start dropping off. It's the plant's response. So it's just too hot, can't do it, sorry, I'll wait till it's cool again. And then it kind of just waits. And then in the fall, you'll get a big flush. But if you start your seeds indoors with peppers and tomatoes, and then you're, you're able to get them outside, you know, a, a little bit earlier, and then, or they're, they're a little older whenever you get them outside, and then you have a chance of getting fruit before it gets too hot for it. And then broccoli and cabbage just have a long growing season, so uh, it would get too hot by the time, if you were to start it outside by seed, for most years it would get too hot by the time it came time to harvest it. Um, so as far as planting seeds goes, it's really simple. Um, again, if you go to a vegetable in the app, we have a guide here for how deep you plant the seed, 
how many days it takes to sprout so you know that if you've marked it on this date then you know you know when to expect it to start sprouting or if it didn't you know you may have a problem um, it shows you the, the height of the plant so you can uh, you got you got to think about not planting things that are tall you know on the south side of an, an, another plant that likes sun because then it's gonna be shaded so you got to think about things like that and this will help me map that out we're gonna be adding a lot of features that make that even better and even easier I want to add some some uh, like a almost like a layout where you can view your garden and you can see different things and it helps you plan where to go that, that's where we're going with the app but, but for now we have this part um, so so yeah I mean I, I think I've pretty much covered as far as transplants go that's really simple to do um, I recommend buying plants from a nursery the first year that you're starting out because it's a lot to take on you know starting gardening and starting seed starting I didn't even start the indoor seed starting thing until my second year I didn't want to take that on my first year. I wanted to know I was getting healthy plants that, that I at least didn't do that part wrong. And then if something went wrong, I at least had less variables to deal with. So um, once you get your, your transplants, it's really simple to transplant them. One thing I do want to mention as far as transplanting is concerned is it's very important to harden them off. And if you've ever heard that term before, it's simple. It's just introducing them to the elements gradually. So when you get that plant from the nursery, it's been sheltered in perfect conditions its whole life. Um, and when you take that and you go put it in your garden where it gets our Oklahoma wind and our occasional cold nights and all of this stuff, it gets, uh, it gets shocked. So you can help the, the shock of that by kind of gradually uh, taking it out for the first night, it's for a couple hours, for the second night, maybe it's a little bit more. You know, you just kind of gradually expose the elements until about a week later, you've got it out in the ground. Um, and then starting seeds indoors, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. I have a guide on my website and a video that goes into full detail on how we built a seed starting station for about 150 bucks. One thing I will point on or talk about is a lot of people get confused about growing lights, about the temperature and all that kind of thing. If you're just starting seeds, it doesn't matter. Um, the temperature of the light really only comes into play when you're trying to get something to grow to, fr to fruit. So if you were trying to grow a tomato like all the way to full grown indoors, you'd have to worry about that. But I'm just starting seeds until they get that tall and then they're going outside. So with that in mind, just the regular daylight temperatures are fine. But if you just have the red ones, that's fine too. Um, and you just want to get them to where they're just a couple inches away from the light. So again, I've got a video that goes into full detail on, on that and how it works. One other thing I want to mention too is crop rotation. Because it is really important not to plant the same thing in the same place every year. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about diseases today, and that's because if you do this right, you don't have to worry about diseases too much for the most part. Because the way that diseases take hold is they get established over the course of a couple years. So if you grow tomatoes in the same place, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I didn't do anything. Okay. Um, so if you grow tomatoes in the same place year after year, well, the diseases for tomatoes and the pests for tomatoes are going to know where to find the tomatoes. So they start to establish themselves there and they start to lay their eggs there, the pests do. So, um, so you, can present, you can prevent yourself a lot of frustration and issues by, by doing crop rotation and moving things around from year to year. Uh, any questions over planting before we move on to the next? I know I've thrown out a lot of stuff, so feel free to ask any questions you have. So the template that you showed, mm -hmm. was that strictly for planting seeds or was it also for I've used it for onions, so I haven't only used it. And the, the way it works for that is if you're doing transplants. Yeah, let me pass these around. I'm just wondering, you, you're talking about putting the seeds inside with those and then moving them outside. And I guess you're using the mature plant size to figure out how far apart those spaces are. Yeah, and I'm not using this indoors at all. When I start seeds indoors, they're the little individual containers. This is only for when I go outside. So, and most transplants so are only seeds outside. You would use that. Exactly, and most transplants are only one per square. Like all the things I transplant are one per square, like tomatoes, peppers, broccoli, cabbage, right. and even like one per two squares, really, for the most part, yeah. for most of those. So, but this is great for like for beans are nine per square, right? Well, I'm OCD, so if I'm doing it by hand, I'm like it takes me forever. <laughs> but this thing, I just pop it on the ground, I poke the holes, and it's no brainer. And it gets the kids where like they get it all lined up, you know, and. Now I've backed off on some of that and I've started trying to be more efficient with my garden space. And what I mean by that is cabbage is one per square, right? Um, that means if I have a cabbage baby there, it's taking up just this one little area and there's all this empty soil around it. Well, that bugged me when I started. So what I started doing was planting that whole square full of cabbage and just sprinkling it everywhere and then letting the best cabbage win. 
right? And I would, and as they grew, I would see which one was doing best, and I would thin down the other ones. And then as I thin those, that's just, that's microgreen. That's all the nutrition from that cabbage seed plus some rounds of photosynthesis packed into this tiny little thing. That's a superfood. So we just eat those as greens. We throw them in smoothies. They're great in a stir fry, especially cabbage. It has like kind of that taste that a um, an egg roll almost has, like the inside of it. So, um, so that's how I do it. That way, I'm maximizing all that space, and I'm left with one winter cabbage that you know that takes hold. So, so that's the way I handle things like that. But, but for beans, that's great. For onions, it's great. That are 16 per square. That's it's really nice for that, and really more than anything for the kids. And for when I started, it really helped me. Like now, so it's not not as you know I don't use it as much. But when I was starting, that thing was crucial, and it helped me out a lot. Yeah, no problem. So next uh, is watering. So when we first started, I was hand watering everything and that works. But again, I'm a really bad gardener and I'm very excited to water right now and in the spring. And then come July when it's 100, I don't want to go do it. And I'm bored with, I'm tired of fighting squash bugs and I'm, I'm over it, right? Um, so in order to solve that problem, I turned to, to automated drip irrigation. So I ended up building, uh, my first system was made out of PVC pipe. It's a cheaper system to build. And basically all you need to do is take PVC pipe and you cut, you cut the, the pipe the length of the bed. I've got a guide on my website too. I'm gonna keep saying that, I'm sorry, but I have a guide for all this stuff. And you cut the, the PVC pipe to the length of the bed, drill holes every three or four inches or so, and you attach that to ma a main arm. And then there's a hose hook up that you can get for about 250 <coughs> that connects directly into that. And when you when we would flow water through that, water comes out all those through those holes evenly across the whole bed. The problem with that system is you can only water one bed per time, per like at a time, um, which was fine when we first started. And if you only have one or two raised beds, that's that's fine. But at the scale that we have now, it's not practical because I'm out there moving hoses around all the time, like I'm messing up again. So what I started switching to last year was the drip irrigation that has. So I'm sure you've seen it to where it's like the black tubing running and they have little emitters like every so often. I switched to that. They're much more efficient with water and I can water pretty much the whole garden on one or two zones. And that's important to me because I'm wanting to build into the app this, uh, some smart capabilities like watering for you automatically based on how much it's rained and how much it's forecasted to rain and what vegetable it is and all that kind of thing. Well, in order for me to do that, I've got to get better on water. So. So, so I switched to, to, to the other irrigation system. I have guides on my website that walk through how to build both of these. Um, so, so check those out if you want to know more about it. Um, I do want to say on watering, the basic idea behind when to water and how much and all of that, like it was something I struggled with a lot in the beginning. And the biggest mistake I made was overwatering. Um, and the way to know when to water, it's really simple. For most things, there are some things that like to be different and the app will show you for that. But for most things, um, they like to be watered thoroughly, and then they like to dry out a little bit before you water them again. Um, not dried out all the way, but just they, they need to get oxygen in the roots. That's just as important as water. And if they're always underwater, just like us, they can't breathe underwater. So if you, um, so the way I water is I, I water my raised beds until there's water coming out the bottom, and I know that they are flooded and they are definitely watered. And then I don't water again until uh, I can stick my finger down in the soil and about two or three inches down, it's pretty dry. That's when I know when to water again, I do the same thing again. So right now, that's like once a week maybe. In the summer, it'll be maybe once every three or four days. It changes based on temperature and wind and humidity and all sorts of things. So if I figure out an algorithm to tell you when, I'm, I will let you know. I'm working on it. Um, but it's a complicated one to figure out. But I, yes, go ahead. So I was, you were talking about using the black TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you basically just manually turning that on and off? You're not trying to use any kind of a timer or anything to... I do have an automated timer. I have an Orbit 4 outlet automated timer. Okay. Um, okay. And I have a different one hooked in that, and those are on different programs. So the way I have it set so up right now... Each outlet can be programmed differently. Mm -hmm. So I have a different hose, and it's kind of a mess because I got hoses everywhere, but I have four of those hooked up to different beds at a time through the PVC systems. Okay. And that way, and I, I'm usually not starting, so, so the thing, the time I really need that system is when I'm starting seeds. Because you've got to keep the seeds moist until they sprout. And in a raised bed, it's difficult, especially in the summer. So I have them programmed to run, you know, every day, you know, when I'm starting, when I'm trying to sprout seeds. And I'm typically not starting seeds on more than four beds at a time anyway, because I have different rotations going. 
So, and then the other ones, I just kind of move one over. Like I have a Saturday or Sunday where I just cycle through all my beds and they all get watered once. And that's kind of how I handle that. Any questions about watering before we move on to the next section? So the next step is feeding your plants and then fertilizer and all of that. And if you follow the steps before where you get compost from a lot of different sources, you don't have to worry about this that much because um, it should all be in the compost for the most part, especially the phosphorus and the potassium, uh, magnesium, all that kind of thing should be plenty in the compost. The, the one thing that you're, you're going to have to add from time to time, though, is definitely nitrogen because it's water soluble. When it rains, it gets flushed out. It's used a lot by plants. It's the number one thing they use. So you're going to need nitrogen. And there's a couple different ways to get it. And the cool thing is there's some natural ways to get it that don't even involve buying anything. Um, so there are plants that um, the, the ironic thing about gardening is that plants need nitrogen for the most part. And, and the air is made up of 90 of 78 percent of nitrogen or something like that but most plants aren't able to get that out of the air, right? But there are some plants that can. So peas and beans and clover and a lot of other crops are in the legume family and they're able to actually take nitrogen out of the air and put it down in the soil. So then other plants that are around them are able to use that. So you can use those concepts and that's called cover crops. If you ever hear that, that's what that means. It's growing those crops before something you're gonna grow that would require a lot of it. So that's one way to do it. If you want to buy something, which makes it a lot easier, um, fish fertilizer is a great option. It's just dead fish that have been blended up. It's the same way the Indians planted, you know, like uh, it's, it's a great way to grow. Um, rabbit manure is a great source of, of fertilizer as well. Uh, we have a Flemish giant rabbit that gets up to 20 pounds because we wanted the most efficient manure maker we could find when we, when we got a rabbit. I'm all about efficiency. Um, I do recommend getting a soil test. You can get them here. Um, or through OSU, through your county extension office. And they're like 15 bucks, but it'll show you what your soil is deficient in or what it has. If you're growing in the ground, I definitely recommend doing that. If you're doing the mix where you're making your own, like I said, you probably don't need to go through all that if you got compost from good sources. Just keep adding nitrogen. Um, and nitrogen is different for every plant. Um, there are some plants you can give too much nitrogen to, like tomatoes. If you give it too much nitrogen, it's just going to produce all green and no tomatoes. So there is a balance to it. Um, this information is in the app too for each vegetable. It'll help guide you through it. Um, for greens, for the most part, I'll give it fish fertilizer every two or three weeks. And then for, for tomatoes and cucumbers and things like that, I'll give it fish fertilizer until it starts producing fruit and then I back off. So that's a basic easy way to remember is if it's not growing to fruit, uh, you can give it every two or three weeks. Or if it looks a little sick, so if it looks a little yellow or um, you can just kind of tell, like once you start gardening, you just kind of get to know your plants and you can tell when they're a little down that day and once they're pick me up, you know? So, um, yeah, uh, so definitely get a soil test if you're gonna be growing in the ground though. It's a completely different ball game. But the good thing about Oklahoma, yes, we have a lot of clay, but that clay holds a lot of nutrients. It's got a lot of stuff in it. So if you can get it broken up, then for the most part, you're gonna have a lot of the stuff you need to grow food. Um, the next two steps are harvesting and cooking and stuff. And for that, I'm just going to say that for each vegetable, we have specific instructions for how to do that in the app. So for beans, for example, we have harvest instructions here. And then also um, we have blog posts on our website that have a lot of recipes for different things. So any blog post, like for, for beans, for example, they're pulled in here automatically. So you can, uh, you can, see, you can see blog posts that are for that vegetable that, that come in, in here and then and you can, you can tap on those and they take, they take you out to our website. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any questions before I jump into another topic or, yes, go ahead. Where do you get your wood chips? Wood chips, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so I get mine from the Norman Compost Facility. Uh, I know, I know, <laughs> don't get the compost there. I know, I know, but here's, here's the logic, okay? I know, I know like I contradict, but here's the logic. Um, I, I, I've been there and I have videos of the giant chipper and they're literally taking a tree and dropping it into it, okay? So trees aren't sprayed with anything. It's the yard clippings that are, and that's what they make the compost out of. This, this, these wood chips are just made out of, of trees that landscaping companies chop down, they bring in here, they drop it to the chipper. It was a tree a week ago, right? Like, and I'm not worried about there being all that in trees. So, um, so that's where I get my wood chips. And, uh, and it's free down there, no matter where you live. People ask me all the time, is it free if I'm not a Norman resident? Yes, they are happy to get rid of stuff. They just want to charge if you bring stuff in. They're in the business of getting stuff out. So 
Uh, they do charge for compost, but again, we talked about that earlier. Don't buy that. Um, sorry, guys. I love the guys down there, but I just I can't tell people to buy it. You know, but get all their wood chips because their wood chips are super high quality too. And every time I'm in in one of those stores that sells wood chips, I always I can't say the name. I'm always worried I'm gonna get sued if I say the name. But um, <laughs> if I'm in one of those stores and I see people buying it, I go over there. I'm like, please go to my website. Yeah. Like you're you're spending so much money. And, and, the, and those wood chips from the store too are oftentimes it's wood that you don't, it's like the same pallet wood that I told you about earlier that's run through a chipper and it's dyed to look those colors. Yeah. And it's, and whereas I know that the, the wood chips I'm getting here are from trees from Oklahoma and, and some people have concerns about the type of tree. Like I know there are certain trees that can cause issues and stuff, but uh, I, I haven't had any issues. There's also chipdrop.com, that's C-H-I-P-D-R-O-P.com. You can sign up so that when landscaping companies have a big load of wood chips they need to dump, they can come dump them at your property if you sign up for it. That's just what I was going to ask you, is if you wow. don't have like something to load them up in. And, That's awesome. And yeah, and I, I signed up a couple years ago, and I've got one delivery so far. So, but, but I've heard of other people that have gotten it. Um, I've also seen people on Craigslist that basically their side business is delivering wood chips from Norman for 40 bucks or something like that. So, um, so yeah. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, like, uh, I just get them dumped in the back of my truck. I throw a tarp over it because you can get a ticket if you drive around without stuff flying around. It's just kind of a dangerous situation. So make sure you do that. The first couple times I didn't know that, you know. Um, I was new to all this, y'all. Three years ago, I was, I mean, I, I showed, I, I, we've had people come in since I showed this. Three years ago, this is where we started. I'd never grown anything in my life. And we took basically everything we learned through that and put it in, into this app. So you can, you can read more about in, in the about tab in the app. We, we kind of we have links to the story. I wrote like kind of the whole story of how we started and, and all of that. Um, I write a lot about anxiety and depression because that's what led to us doing this. I've had anxiety and depression my whole life and um, I've worked on computers my whole life. And my wife is a nurse and she helped me figure out that maybe I was looking at them too much. So I started doing this during the day, you know, like doing half and half and that's what led to to all of this and it was the first thing in my life that actually made a difference and made, made me feel better and that's why I'm so passionate that's why I'm here tonight because this stuff has changed my life and that's why we made the app because I feel like if more people grew their food and, and ate it I think we'd have a better world a happier world a healthier world so so yeah that, that's a bit about who we are I, <laughs> thank you it's a, good hobby. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great hobby too yeah anytime I'm stressed out I go out in the garden um, so I'm, I'm going to show some of the app now. I mean, we've talked about, you know, the getting started. But I want to show you how can you can actually use the app now practically. So um, we've already showed beans. Let's choose something else. Throw out something. What do you all want to grow? What should I look at? Strawberries. Strawberries. Okay. So I'm going to go down to strawberries and tap on it. And this will give you information about, uh, like I mentioned earlier, these dates are specific to where you live. So we find the nearest weather station closest to you. They have 100 years of freeze data at that weather station. We use that to try and predict dates for when we think it's going to freeze. We were three days off this year. Um, but here's the thing you can, you can go in here. So if you go into the settings screen, you can actually see the different dates and the calculated risk for each date. So if you want to play things a little bit risky, you can. You can choose something. By default, we choose 10%, and I recommend sticking with that. I mean, this year it was April 5th, 15th was our last freeze. So it was three days after normal. Um, and also the same thing for, for first fall frost. We're going to have an update before you have to worry about it that gives you dates for, for when to plant in the fall. So don't worry. I got you covered. I'll get it in there. It's just we don't got to worry about it yet, so I haven't added it in yet. Um, as you scroll down, we just launched this in January, too, by the way. So we have a lot of things I want to add, like... This is what I do from 4 a.m. to 7.30 every morning is code for this. And then I do my day job during the day, and then I be a dad, and then I either go to sleep or do more of this. So, and then I repeat every day. <laughs> so this, uh, and up at the top left, it shows you the growing season. So there's perennial, cool season, and, and, and warm season. Uh, perennial just means it comes back year after year. The number per square, we talked about that. The time to harvest, you know, stuff like strawberries. Technically, you're going to get strawberries the first year, but it's better to pick them off and let the roots develop. And then, you know, the second year, you'll have a larger harvest. So uh, it's going to give you for each one. The watering, I want to make this watering section better. Right now, it's just text. I want to, I want to give you, and same for sun, I, I want to find a way to give you hard data. Instead of saying full sun, I want to tell you this many hours for where you live. You know, like, I'm working on that part. Again, I just got to figure out the algorithm. So, um, 
Outdoor transplant method we talked about earlier, or outdoor planting method, we talked earlier about seed versus transplant. This just shows you whether or not it's a transplant or something you start from seed. Um, if it is something you start from seed, it'll show you the depth of plant and how many days and all that kind of thing. If it's not a transplant, obviously we won't show you that. It gives you a mature height. The family is important because of the crop rotation stuff I mentioned earlier. So don't follow something from the same family with something else from the same family. That's why we have that on there. And then the harvesting and then and the cooking instructions. This is, uh, so this is an ad for, for, for smart pots that we have in here. And this is, this is a, how we make money on the app. So we have links to things to buy on Amazon. Um, the cool thing though, is that everything I've linked to in here are things that I buy myself and things I've tested out and things I believe in. So when we first started building the app, I tried the, the Google ad network where it was just random ads. And the first one was some junk like, is your spouse cheating on you? Click here to find out. And I was like, I'm not going to have that in my app. And then I got to thinking, and I was like, you know what? Like, there's a lot of stuff I buy anyway. Like, I'll just link to those products. And now I'm starting to build a relationship with those products so that I must be selling them directly. So if you want to help support us, you can just, you know, buy those things through the app. Also, there's an Amazon button in the top right that you can buy literally anything. Someone bought some patio furniture the other day. And we got a couple bucks off of that. So thank you to whoever did that. Um, there's some interesting, and I can't see, I can't see what you buy. I just see what was bought. So don't worry, I can't see what you're buying or who it is. I just see what was bought. Someone asked me that, like, well, are you gonna see what I'm buying? I'm like, no, I just see that it was bought. <laughs> yeah, question, go ahead. I just wondered if, if you have something like that for the uh, irrigation stuff. I'm working on it. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we just launched three months ago and I'm in that, like, trying to reach out to vendors phase, so if, if you're watching on the live stream and you work for a drip irrigation company, sorry, I got to put it in the thing. Because I'm trying, dripworks.com is a great company. And I'm trying to get in with them. Because, and that's, a, that's where I tell you to reach out to, dripworks.com. Because they have guides on their website that help you calculate exactly how much you need and help you plan out your garden. Like, they've got really cool stuff going over there. Say that with um, the branding again. Dripworks.com. Dripworks. Yeah. Um, so I do, uh, for all the gardens, I do a lot of community gardens and things like that around the city. And for those gardens, I just go to Home Depot and buy it there. That way, if they ever have a problem or need a replacement part, it's always a couple miles away generally. Um, so that's where I have bought my drip irrigation stuff if I wanted to buy it at a place like that. Um, it's pretty good prices there too. It seems like a logical tie in. I hope so, yeah. I mean. It's just so many hours in the day, you know, like I'm struggling to find time to either code or reach out to people or write marketing messages. It's me and my wife and our four kids trying to represent. In fact, I do want to mention my daughter here at Brooklyn is here and I guess Daphne left with, with my other, but they actually built um, every single vegetable that you look at. This top section was made by one of them too. It was so cool. We had a night where all four of us were around in the, in the living room on our laptops and I taught them how to do one and Adobe Spark Post is this really cool app where you can make cool graphics, so I ma we made that in it. And taught them how to do one, and then they went through and made it for all the other ones. So, uh, so this is very much a family affair. My wife does all the typing and all the editing for all the, the actual data. If it was me, it would be very robotic. I'm very, like, to the point about things. So she adds some flair to the text, I guess. And, and, and she helps me a lot with it. I mean, this is, we work, this is our date night. Like, um, <laughs> this is what this is seriously what we do on date night is we get some wine and we and we sit in the room and we go through and we talk and we look up vegetables and we and we type about them and we and we do like we do a lot of live streams where it's just us on the couch talking about like what we're growing and stuff like that. So we do that on our YouTube and our Facebook and all that kind of thing. Um, something else I want to show that I haven't shown yet. So uh, I've shown like everything that talks about how to grow that specific plant. But one of the challenges is knowing what you can plant around that, right? And that's why we built this companions tab here. So if you click on it, it's gonna show you everything that grows well around that plant. And on the other hand, it's also gonna show you everything that grows not well around that plant. Brooklyn has a question. About the companion tabs on chives, it has peas on good and peas on bad. But that's a bug you gotta tell me in private. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I spent four years of my career as a tester, and never once did I bring up a bug in the middle of a presentation about the software. <laughs> I got to train you on that part. The great tester, though, they have caught. Some, that's my testing team too. They've caught a lot of our of our bugs. So, um, so yeah, it's going to show you the bad too. It's also on the pest tab. It's going to show you what pests attack that vegetable. Um, on this critters tab, we show you all pests, but on this one, it's the ones that attack that specific vegetable. 
And then we also have a list of beneficial insects and not just insects, but like even things like cats, like generally they're a pest in the garden, right? But what we try and do is help you turn those negatives into positives. So cats, for example, if you just put a litter box out there that's covered, they'll probably want to go in that more than your garden anyway. And if you put catnip over where you're having issues with mice, then they're going to solve that mouse problem for you. And they're going to go to that catnip. So it's just, and, it's, and if you put motion activated sprinklers where you don't want them to go, they're not going to go there. Same with birds. Birds are going to eat your pests, right? But they could also eat your tomatoes. We'll put a motion activated sprinkler on the tomatoes and the birds aren't going to go near there. So you can use all of these things of nature to your advantage and not have to use pesticides or anything like that because you're just using nature to your advantage. Like ladybugs, someone you asked earlier about you about ladybugs. Um, if you go to the pest tab here, we're going to recommend, first of all, we're going to recommend to spraying off the aphids because that's the easiest way to deal with them. But if it's a really bad issue, or if, if spraying off isn't working, you can buy ladybugs on Amazon and you can release those. If you release them at night, they won't just fly away because they only fly during the day. And then they'll, they'll, they'll mate and lay their eggs there and then they're going to take care of your aphids for you. So those are the kind of things we try and recommend. Yes, another there, question. There, there are nurseries also that sell. Yes, products. yes. Ladybugs, I know for sure. GLC has. Yeah. And they say, we've read, if you order them, it says it's good to have them in your I do know that the, the ones that I've, I'm not going to say specific nurseries, but I have called around and they're getting from the same place as I am whenever I order. Um, they probably are the Asian lady beetles though. They're, they're not going to be the ones that are native. Norman specifically that I know of that, that always has them. On the east side, Norman? Yeah, on the east side, Norman, on the east 12th Street. Okay. Markham, Markham's over there. Yeah. There's a big nursery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And the, and the like, same thing with like praying mantis. You can buy praying mantises too. Like all these things that nature is engineered to help you. And also, it's you know if you, if you spray pesticides, you're killing those good guys too. So things like spiders, although they creep my kids out, they're super helpful in the garden. And and bees too. Like bees help you pollinate. Like all of these things, you've got to have them um, around. So uh, another thing I want to mention as far as where to get things locally, uh, Prairie Wind Nursery down in Norman is my favorite place to go shopping for herbs. So if you're, if you're into herbs at all, uh, I definitely recommend going there. Let me show like rosemary, for example. Um, the reason why uh, herbs are important, and this is something important to talk about, I think, because um, I didn't necessarily understand the, understand the value of them when I started, but companion planting, the thing I, I've talked about where you, um, you plant things around each other that help each other, um, Herbs are something that really help with that because the way that pests find what they're looking for is through smell. So if you have a whole bed of just peppers, well, the pest that likes peppers is going to have a really easy time finding them. But if you have a pepper and an oregano and then something else and then a, a rosemary, well, these herbs all, all have a really strong scent and it puts up a scent mask in the air so that the pest is confused. And they might find one pepper, but they're not gonna find the whole row next to it, right? And they're, and they're gonna be isolated to that one area. So we have herbs in about 30 to 40% of our beds. And that's why we started growing them initially. But then once we started growing food and we committed ourselves to the first year, we wanted to eat out of the garden most ex almost exclusively. And squash gets very boring after you have it the same way every day. <laughs> but if you have different herbs, then you can throw them in and you have a completely different flavor from night to night. And the cool thing about Prairie Wind Nursery in Norman is he carries different varieties of each. So if you go to any of those typical stores, they're going to have three types of basil. Sweet basil, maybe the Thai basil, and maybe uh, a lemon basil, like th three tops. But at Prairie Wind, he has 14. And he has, and of all the different herbs, he's a geek like me, and he's been doing this for 30 years. So, and he's been cultivating his own varieties of things that are made to do well here. Like this own, he has his own variety of sage he's cultivated that just explodes here. It does amazing here. So, and he's one of the most interesting people I've ever met. We have videos of us doing presentations together that I definitely recommend checking out because he is just one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met on this topic. So, um, I, I want to give them a shout out because I'm a big fan of, of them and I like the different variety they have down there. No, no, so they specialize in Mediterranean herbs, but also native plants. So they do a lot of native perennials and landscaping plants. They do some vegetables as well. Like he has tomatoes and stuff down there, but he doesn't specialize in it, he just has it. Um, but like, I've, anytime I go down there, the first time I went down there, I spent three hours just in the herb section, just tasting each different variety and trying stuff. And he had stuff I've never even heard of. Like there's this uh, Vitmanese cilantro 
that's in the app that is not technically a cilantro. It is uh, an imitation cilantro. So it tastes like cilantro, but it grows in the summer, unlike cilantro. So cilantro typically grows in the spring and the fall here. When it gets hot, it bolts and you can't grow anymore. But this Vitamine cilantro grows, it loves the heat. It can take as much heat as you throw at it. It's a little spicier than cilantro, but I like it more. And you know, things like this, or I'd never even heard of it until I met Bill from Prairie Wind. And then he carries all this stuff down there. He has another type of cilantro called Puerto Rican cilantro that is a similar thing. And just like, he has a lot of things down there that you're not gonna find anywhere else. What's the name of it? Prairie Wind Nursery okay. in Norman. It's down by Lake Thunderbird. Um, we're at, we're going to be out. At, he, he's so I'm at, I'm going to be at the Myriad Gardens tomorrow at OK, uh, OKC Garden Fest. He's going to be out there too and have a bunch of plants out there. So that'd be a convenient way for you to get to him in, in the city without having to drive down there if you want to. And he's at a lot of places. Like every time there's a plant festival around here, he's at it or speaking at something. Yes. Me, I volunteer two three times a week, two 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 three half a day a week mm -hmm. at Chesapeake Gardens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I used to work out there a long time ago before I had any idea what I was doing. Oh, really? Like 10 years ago, I went out there for a few weeks and goofed off, and that was about the end. I go over there three times a week, and uh, that's a, this year is my third year I'm going over there. They grow lots of herbs over there, and uh, the cilantro that you said, there are two kinds that I have in my backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, Italian cilantro and regular cilantro. They grow in summertime very well here in Oklahoma. You sure it's not parsley? Because they look. Are you sure it's not parsley? Because they look exactly alike. Okay. Yeah, the, the parsley will grow in the summer here. Okay. Oh, that's okay. I used to grow like seven, eight thousand onions every summer, and I keep them away. Uh huh. Because I have to take care of them. Okay, I was giving away like six, seven, maybe more thousands of. Uh, pounds of tomatoes, eggplants, you name it. They're not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We're going to your house. Summertime, I don't buy any herbs or any vegetables. That saves you so much money, doesn't it? Not really, because I'm just wasting. But I share. I share with friends and whoever. I'll be over this place. Are there any other questions or anything you want me to go more detail on? Yes, question back. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever had any experience. Like, I know there's like um, some kumquats and satsumas. I, I was just wondering if you've ever tried them. No, not any citrus. Uh, I know people that have been able to do it if they take them in a greenhouse in the winter or something like that. I've never heard of a citrus that actually could tolerate our, our, our winters try, outside. You have to transfer summertime inside and winter. I mean, yeah, summertime outside, wintertime inside. I have several different ones. Uh, when I, I go to a trip, this brother is taking care of them. <laughs> yeah, I read, I know there's like this Texas company that they've been like crossbreeding. I, I think they try to make like a satsuma that can tolerate our temperatures here. Even in the, in the, in the, in the winter? Yeah, yeah I think they're, they're calling it the Arctic Frost Satsuma. Yeah, I need to, I need to, I should need to research more about it. I hadn't heard about that. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't done, like, I haven't done avocado. I haven't done, and really, with fruit trees, I'm pretty limited. I've done some pear and some apple. So far, I've really just focused on on fruits and vegetables like you know berries and stuff like that but the tree, trees are something we're just in an urban area we're in a third of an acre we, we, we've already used all of our tree space that i can you know like um yeah so hopefully we'll get out to an acreage at some point and then we can have every i, I can have one of everything of every variety like i do for spinach i have 14 varieties of spinach right now i collect them <laughs> same with herbs i have one of every herb that bill has down there <laughs> just <laughs> It's the same energy I put into collecting football cards when I was a kid. Goes into collecting herbs now. <laughs> you must be the healthiest guy in town. No, no, I'm I'm really good at growing it and not as good about eating it. Like I, it makes no sense. I have a whole garden full of spinach and I'll still like, like I'm trying to get better at that. And that's what I'm trying to learn now personally is from people about how to use this stuff more. And now that we have a bunch of stuff from coming from the garden, we're doing it more. But in the winter, I don't grow enough to preserve. Um, yeah, I, I got to get better at that. But the thing is, the indicator for me is that whenever my anxiety starts flaring up and whenever my panic attacks come back and my depression comes back, then I know that I need to get back on track with my diet. Um, so I have an indicator, you know, and, 
and then I just start eating better again and start drinking a lot of water again and then generally I start to feel better so you're, you're taking care of the critical, critical part. and hopefully teaching the kids you know uh, how they can and then they've grown up with it now so it's part of their lives they have their own gardens uh, yes. they're very involved in what we do and so for me it's just about not necessarily having any regrets about mistakes I've made it's just trying to figure out how to change it for the generation after me and well, Yes, question. Go ahead. So, first, the app is so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Like, good for you. That's so cool. Well, I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you have the earliest outside planting. Uh huh. Is there plans to maybe add, like, a later, latest planting? Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, I think earlier I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining. Uh, so, uh, by fall, I would definitely have that in there. Um, don't worry I got your back I'll have it in there it's just we don't need it yet and um, technically I have the code for it written but I've got to go through and look at every vegetable and vet that date in my own personal time zone to make sure I agree with it and I've got to block off like three or four hours to do that and I'll have it done before it actually matters to anyone though before like before it gets too late to worry about it so we've got probably another month and a half before I have to uh, before I have to have it done so so like if, if Mm -hmm. still good. We can still plant. Yeah, there's some things that like, so basically I wouldn't do any cool season stuff. Okay. So that'd be an easy way for you to know what to do right now okay. is look at the warm season stuff. Um, you know, like things like lettuce and spinach just aren't going to tolerate the heat. And what they do is they, they do what's called bolting where the middle stalk gets really tall and it shoots up and they turn into, and it starts making flowers and seeds. Okay. And by then the leaves are all bitter and you're not gonna be able to get any more off of it. Well, it does that when it gets hot. So, um, but you know, th there are some things you could maybe do. So if you want to try and grow maybe, maybe like carrots, for example, which typically is a cool season crop, if you planted it on the, on the east side of your house where it gets shade in the afternoon, it's going to be 30 degrees cooler there in the summer than it is out in full sun. So you might be able to grow longer there. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can take two T-posts in the ground and stick them on the west side of your bed and then attach shade cloth and then you have a shade wall or what's even cooler is if you take this tt post and, and you attach uh do you know what hardware mesh panels are they they have them at so the people that lay concrete okay if you've seen like a sidewalk being laid they lay down those like hardware mesh panels you can get those at uh, home depot or whatever and it's cheaper than buying any tomato cages or any other stuff and you can make cages out of that kind of stuff well anyway you can take those and just attach them to two t posts and then you can grow something up that that will make a living shade wall. So cucumbers, the loofah plant is really cool to grow. Like, you know, the things used in the shower, the loofah, you can grow that and you just grow it and it, it, it's a gourd and then it dries like a squash is a gourd. It dries over the wind, over, over the summer. And then when it dries, you peel the outside and it's that inside, that little like thing. You, so like that takes over a whole wall. Uh, morning glories take over a wall if you just want to do flowers. Uh, pole beans will, will, will take over a wall like that. There's a lot of things you can grow. That way you're using that sunlight for something and it's on the west side of your bed then it's shading everything in the afternoon that's the typical would be getting full sun. Yeah, build it on the west side. That way in the afternoon it, it gets shade. Yes? Um, so we, we have a dog that really likes vegetables. Um, and so yeah. So we, um, we didn't have a dog problem for a long time, but we had a mouse problem. <coughs> so I got a dog and it solved my, my mouse problem and then I had a dog problem. <laughs> so um, I did want to go into that whole story tell, you know, that fairy tale where you got to keep it in the bigger animal. So I built the fence and I just have it to where, you know, the dog can't go over on that side unless in the winter, then I let it, it's a half husky. So she hunts in there in the winter. Um, so that's what I had to do. I have tried every method um, from onions. I have a test bed on the other side of the yard where I'm literally trying things right now. And my dog just goes over there and pees in it every morning, no matter what I do. <laughs> so um, I'm try I I've tried the pepper. I've tried onions. I've tried um, repellent sprays. I've tried everything I can think of or find. Um, and the stuff I have found that would maybe work, I didn't want to do. So. Um, so I just built a fence 
and you know it's just, it's just the cost of having that dog <laughs> and I won't get a husky again <laughs> yes ma'am Yeah, so Brooklyn and I actually built the fence three times in one day because every time we built it, it wasn't like something was wrong with it. But the way we built ours was we took just the four inch by four inch posts and then just put those in the ground. And then I just attached two by fours connecting them. And then I just bought the slats and just nailed them to it up on that fence. So there's it's slats every couple inches. And that was the part I messed up on was my OCD made it to where like, it wasn't right when it keeps redoing it. So, um, so anyway, that was a real simple way to get it. And then I cemented the posts in. But, um, but that's, a, that's really simple to do. Like you just buy a bag of quick feet and mix it and just put it there. Um, but that's how I built my fence. You could do the like T-post and cattle panel. Like cattle panels that are 14 feet long and five feet tall are $20 at Tractor Supply. I use the, those to make arch trellises because you can put it like make an arch out of them. But you could attach that to T-post as well. You have to figure out a gate situation. But um, my wife really likes like the white picket fence look, so I, I wanted it to look nice for her. And we have like an archway going into it and all that kind of thing. So, so that's why we built ours that way. But there's a lot of different fences you can build that would work. They sell this new foam now instead of using concrete, you can foam it in. Oh, okay. It's actually kind of cool. Because if you ever have to bring it up, it's a lot easier to take it off. Yeah, so it's just a foam that gets heavy and then. Yeah, it's like a kind of like a mixture, like a liquid form, and you just pour it in your bowl. Mm -hmm. foam up like that insulation spray stuff. Very cool. Were there any other questions or anything you all want to know more about? I can go into more detail on whatever you'd like. I kind of skimmed over a lot of stuff. So, um, Where did you say you get your chips at Norman? The Norman Compost Facility. It's down by Rudy's off of Highway 9. Um, do Lincoln Parks come back every year? Do what's come back every year? Hearts, I don't know what Bleeding Hearts are. I'm sorry. I, the food is what I know. I'm getting better at the flowers. My wife is forcing me to get better at it. We're doing more of it, but um, the. F <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know much about it. The the gardening or the growing food books are the only ones I memorize. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Where do you get your seeds and stuff? Your um, so for seeds, uh, I mean, right now. Oh, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned that. We have seeds out here, up here for for anyone. So. We have bags of seeds that are all things that can be grown right now. Um, but personally, I get mine. I'm usually, I'm usually trying to find a specific variety. So Johnny's Seed Company is where you can order from online. Uh, locally, um, Markham's Nursery over off of Sooner, that specific one, carries seeds in bulk. So that's a great place to save some money. So like I buy my kale and my spinach there because I plant so much of it that it's just worth it to buy it there in bulk. And you can just go and weigh it out and it's just it's a lot cheaper um tlc nursery has a pretty good selection of different varieties up on up on north side that one has a pretty good variety but uh for me it's just and and, that, and like the first year i just i bought a lot of seeds too so i still have some i'm using if you keep them in the fridge they'll last a little bit longer so Uh, I don't know the, the web. It was Johnny Selected C. Is that johnnyc.com? Okay. So um, we have a contest. I, I almost forgot about it. I'm glad I didn't. So we have some smart pots here. They donated some smart pots to us today. We're going to give out. So we're going to go through and start with the small one. And then we'll go through and, and go from there. So the first one is uh, first, are there any other questions before we do this part? Dad, you want to come out? Yeah. So this is the five gallon smart pot and I'm going to go to the smart pot page in the app so we can look at what is the right size for that because I don't remember. Seven gallon is the smallest I have in the app but this five gallon will be pretty much the same. So you can grow lettuce in, the, in here, kale, spinach, um, herbs. I actually met someone today that gave me a really cool idea. He has, he has peppers in ones this size and what he does is he puts these inside of a kiddie pool and then fills it up with water. So it's sub-irrigated, it doesn't dry out as fast, and he has a whole kitty pool lined with these. So um, we were supposed to do a sign-up sheet, but we didn't do it. So I've got to come up with an idea for a contest on the fly. So I'm gonna ask a question about something from earlier in the presentation. I should have thought about this beforehand, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I put myself on the spot here. 
Okay. Let's do that. Can we do that? Thank you. Thank you so much for helping me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's do a drawing. Uh, let's figure out how to do this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Sweet. Can you come back every month of these? <laughs> All right, we got a hat here. Okay. You know what? I got a one question we'll start with until we get the drawing going at least. What is the, uh, there, are three com there are three ingredients I use in soil mix, compost, peat moss, and, I'm sorry, I heard one over there. I, I think it was a tie, but she's also doing the numbers, so I feel like, we all agree that she deserves it, I mean. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Just put a number on there, yeah, or a name. Yeah, a name would probably be best, yeah. Yeah, just write your first name on there, and we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. Normally, my wife is here to help with this part, but our babies revolted against this, and she had to go. So, y'all see how useless I am without her now. <laughs> While everyone's doing this, I do want to mention, too, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We do everything we do, I record and put online. So, if you're not able to make it to a class, we do a lot of different classes. So this class here we do on the first Friday of every month. Starting next month, we're gonna be doing this class and then immediately after, a different topic every month. So next month, it's probably gonna be about how to grow and cook with 10 different herbs, where Bill and I go in detail on like 10 different things, how to grow them, how to cook with them. Um, and then uh, at the Myriad Gardens, I'm, I'm gonna start doing classes on the third Thursday of every month out there. Um, we have events all across the city at just different events. Like tomorrow will be at OKC Garden Fest. And, that's all day. It's from 9 until 4. I'm speaking at 1, but you just heard what I'm talking about. Um, but at 2, we're doing that herb thing that I mentioned that Bill and I are doing. I definitely recommend coming to that. More so because of Bill, more than me. Like, Bill's just awesome. Hey, we had a couple questions that came up on the live stream, and they're probably questions you guys might have too, so I thought I would just answer them. Um, one of them is about rainwater collection, um, and I do want to mention we have a guy, so I, I have built two different systems. One of them is with uh, IBC totes, where there are 275 gallon IBC totes. I've connected two of those together with a whole filtration system and everything. I've got a YouTube video that goes into detail on that, so check it out. Um, and then also I've done one with a 55 gallon barrel. So, yes, go ahead. Question. Do like rock sand so, what I did on my filtration system, it was a first flush system. So, there's just PVC that the water comes down into first, and then there's a cap so when it fills up, it seals the water off and then it diverts over. So, I'm not doing, and then I have a pantyhose in between, but I'm not doing micron filters. I'm not drinking out of it. And honestly, I didn't even need the filter system. I thought it was cool and I wanted to build it. Um, it was like real life Mario because these like you know six inch PVC pieces and like it was fun you know I find things on YouTube and I just like have to build it so all right do we have everyone's name in here yep. thank you so much for doing this y'all <laughs> I was on the spot and I didn't know what I was gonna ask and that was the only question I could think of so yes you can draw it here okay hold on we gotta shake it up shake it up you didn't make any deals with anyone did you no you sure no. you got a side thing going here no okay. <laughs> Roger West. Roger, all right. So Roger, we have a three gallon one. This will be great for all the things I mentioned before. Um, peppers even will be good in there. Uh, I would sub irrigate it for sure. Just put it in a thing of water, a pan, or you can go to garage sales and get like little pan. Hold on, before we do this one, let me talk about what we're giving away next. I jumped the gun. So the next one is the Big Bag Bed Mini. I gotta go slow when I say that. Um, I think these are 25, 15 gallons. Um, you can grow pretty much anything in here. Um, these are great, especially for a little herb garden, something like that. Um, yeah, so who, who won this one? What? <laughs> Jovan? Yes! All right. 
Okay. And next we have a big bag bed junior. These are 50 gallons. Again, you can grow anything you want in here. You could have a whole herb little garden in here. Um, it's very similar to the size we have here. So you can see how much they have in there. Um, yeah, these, these are great. So probably two bags of potting mix will get you to we'll fill this up. All right. Who's next? Manuel? All right. Congratulations. And last, we have the giant one, the big bag bed. This thing, you can grow whatever you want in here. Uh, we've got like 12 of these now. We, we love these so much. Um, yeah, here you can hold it up. Okay, and you want to draw too? Shake it up, shake it up. I'm not going to refold it for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next is <laughs> Crystal Robertson. Yeah. All right. My hat was lucky hat. Hat. <laughs> Oh, here's your hat back. So yeah, that's everything I had scheduled to talk about. If you have any other questions, feel free to, yes, go ahead. The Myriad Gardens tomorrow. There's an outdoor garden festival all day. And then on our website, we have all of our events uh, too. So, um, but we'll be here uh, at OSU OKC on the first, uh, the first Friday of every month. Uh, we're doing this class. And then starting next month, we're going to do another class immediately after that's more, it's a different topic every month. I don't know what's going to be, just whatever we feel inspired to talk about. And then we'll, and the, for that, we'll bring in guests too. So, Bill Ferris will be here for that one. I'll have um, the former director of the Mary Gardens. Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. I have to go, but tomorrow from 8 o'clock, everybody can go to that Chesapeake. Or to the volunteer garden? 9 o'clock, yes. Awesome. I'll read that. I'll... 63rd and Short Child at that uh, Chesapeake complex. And uh, we have beautiful garden and everything else. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. So yeah, the, the, and actually I've heard a lot, of, a lot of really good things about that community garden too. So if you want to get some gardening experience, that's a great place to go. Um, there's other community gardens around. Uh, I have some personal projects of mine with the Oklahoma Baptist Children's Home. Uh, I run their volunteer garden, their community garden. So if you want to get hands-on experience, we do events like that. Um, we may do a tour of our garden at some point this year. I, I don't know, we'll, we'll see about that. But um, yeah, so any other questions about anything else? There are no stupid questions. Amateur, amateur garden. I killed a cactus one time. <laughs> <laughs> so on your filters, uh, -huh. filters so you can filter by cool season, warm season, warm season, or perennial. Mm -hmm. Does that just mean you can plant that whenever you want? Yeah, so perennials are plants that are genetically capable of coming back every year. Okay, so rosemary, for example, is a perennial. They're not, it's not always going to come back though. Like sometimes, like if our winter is too violent of a switch between temperatures, it'll kill it. But most years it's supposed to come back. So the perennials are ones that you should be able to plant once. And then if you just throw a blanket over on the winter, it'll definitely be okay, you know, on those really cold nights. But, but the things you should only have to plant once and just come back time and time again. Whereas the cool season and the warm season are things you're going to have to plant each time. Um, yeah, so. And we're going to add more filters in there too. And we're going to add things like being able to mark when you planted something so that then we can help guide you through when to start harvesting, you know, even when to water based on how much it's rained where you are. We'll have different filters for favorites so you can mark your favorites, mark, you know, things that are in season. Uh, all that kind of thing is, are things that are on our list of things to add, so. Is, mm -hmm. is there a way, um, now you're you know, doing all the coding and everything, is there a way that you could have it to where like when, when you get the part to where it's the alerts and all mm -hmm. that, do you, would you have a way to put that on like a calendar app that's already on there, like Google Calendar or something like that? Yeah, that's definitely something we want to build into that as well so that kind of, and here's kind of the big vision for where I want the app to get to. And I think you'll have a better understanding of it. So 
the, where I want to get to is you can load the app, choose everything you want to grow, enter how many people are in your family. It calculates exactly what you need to do. It builds this whole calendar for you for here's where you need to do this. There's push notifications attached to that. There's eventually a service for everything you need for the seeds and fertilizer and all that is delivered to your door automatically for the things you want to grow. Like that's what I'm trying to build and trying to get to. Um, so all of those features come along with that because the goal is to make it dead simple to grow food where you don't have to think about it. You just have to do whatever this app tells you to do. Um, and then everything is customized to your location. So if I can get a seed company to partner with us, then we can get, you know, we can recommend varieties that are the right variety for where you live. So if you're in, if you're in Nebraska, you get one, or if you're in Florida, you get a different one. Um, those are the kind of things I'm, I'm working on adding in. And the more that we add stuff like that in, you know, the more that we'll get that tracking feature that goes along with it. Okay. So it's just right right now, you know, like I, my coding window is that 4 to 7 a.m. window, and then I, I have a day job and all that. So we're just trying to find time for it. I so, didn't know where, you're, where the vision was. To yeah. And then also I would like to have a, you know, a visual aspect to it too so you can sketch out your garden, you know, and your beds that you have, and then you can choose what you want to grow, and it kind of just lays everything out for you and says plant all this here. That uses height and sun thing, you know, sun and all that kind of stuff to calculate it for you. That's what I'm wanting to get to. Okay. So, so many things I want to do. Just you know, like <laughs> that's why I never sleep. I wake up to go to the bathroom in the morning. And I can't get back to sleep because I'm just excited to add something new. So, yeah. But thank you for the suggestions. Those are those are awesome. We definitely want to do that. Oh yeah, I threw lots of seeds, and, uh, but they're not coming out. I don't know. What, I don't know what, what were they seeds for? Oh, like uh, parsley, I had parsley, rosemary, uh, different kind of herbs. Uh, okay, I, yeah. Sure, I don't know if I covered them with too much dirt. Well, so a lot of herbs don't start from seed very well, like rosemary and sage and oregano. Even if you did start it from seed, there's no telling what you're going to get um, just because of the nature of how those are, are grown. But if you, but with, with those specific herbs, they're really easy to propagate through cuttings. So you can cut one off of another and stick it in soil and it's going to make roots and make a new plant. So for those, that's why I, in the app I'll have transplant for all of those. Now some of the things you mentioned like parsley can be started from seed, but parsley, the seeds on that take 20 to 25 days I think to sprout and you've got to keep them moist the whole time or they don't sprout. So for parsley, yeah, because parsley is in the same family as carrots and carrots are every bit of three to four weeks. So. And, and temperature also plays a part in that. The warmer it is, the faster they'll sprout, you know. Um, but most of those herbs you mentioned are better as transplants. And then you know exactly what it's going to taste like because you're getting the same plant that you're getting the, the cutting from. Or I did sage last year. I have lots of sage. I have so many. I have to <laughs> yeah. take it out and give it to my friends and family. Yeah. And then for rosemary, the so Bill does all the tests for OSU uh, as far as what varieties do well here and what ones survive our winter. And the ARP variety is the one that's the most resilient to our winters. ARP, A-R-P. Mm -hmm. So that's the, if you're wanting to get one that is gonna have the best chance of surviving our winters, that's the one to get. But there are other varieties too that aren't as winter hardy, but they're just cool to grow. Like the barbecue variety has really, uh, strong stems that make it easy to use as barbecue skewers you can run meat through it and use them like so things like that so and that's the thing i love about prairie wind is he is he has so many varieties down there that you're able to get access to that stuff yes and you're going to have this the first friday of every month first friday of every month we'll be here doing this here and then we'll live stream all like we're doing now and then we're adding more classes too we're doing with the Mary gardens the third thursday of every month starting in july um yes go ahead uh, you said why are we or where are we? Where? Where? I, was, I just said why are we live streaming. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel, the live stream is going to look better um, because I, uh, I can just show you guys here what it looks like this. So it has the video and it has like what I'm showing up there in the top left. On Facebook, it's literally just my phone right there streaming. So. Uh, it's better to watch this stuff on YouTube because I can do all this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, if you just uh, search for From Seed to Spoon on, on, on YouTube, you'll find us. If you download the app, there's a link to, f to YouTube directly in the app, actually. In this menu here, this menu, oh, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm silly. Okay, so this menu expands here. And then we've got links down here at the bottom to our Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Twitter and all of that.
different zones. Um, so there are different climate zones across the U.S. So at the very top of the spectrum is zero, like that's way north. It gets really cold there. The bottom is 13 or, I think 13 or 14. That's way down south where it doesn't freeze, okay? We're in seven, so we're kind of right in the middle of that. So the farther south you go, so when I say zones, that's what I mean. But my goal is that you don't have to know any of that because the app just does that for you. Like it knows your area and it knows your freeze data, which is even better than zone because zone is across a large area. But the app is using your actual weather station, that data. So. My hope is that people don't have to know zones anymore because that's the thing that keep people from doing this because it's all you know intimidating and there's so much stuff to learn. So so that's but that's what zones are. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Do you So one thing we really like to cover with is uh, you can take five gallon water jugs and you can cut the bottom off, and then you can set those over your plant. And then that's one layer, and then you can also put like a blanket on top of that. So for an individual plant layer, you can do that. But on a larger scale, um, you can make these PVC domes that go over your raised beds. And again, I, I'm going to say this again, I've got a guide on my website that shows how to make these. But basically, you just take a 2 by 4 frame, and that covers the bed itself. And then the PVC attaches into that frame. And then over that PVC, you can put either... Um, a variety of things of insect netting or shade cloth or PVC plastic, you know, greenhouse liner, any of that kind of stuff can go over it. So, or even like when the hell storm came, I threw a blanket over it. So, uh, but that's, uh, that's something you can do as well. What's your website? Seedtospoon.net. I, I think it's, oh, it's not up there right now. Sorry. Never mind. Yeah, but it's uh, just, and then I've got cards too uh, that are on the end of these tables. So if, uh, it has links to our website and and Facebook and all that kind of stuff um, as well. We have an email list too, so all of our events that we do, you know, we get an email notification about those. So is it foolproof or something like, you made a foolproof? I hope so, but let me know. I mean, like, but, but we just launched in January, so let me know if there's something that, there's a button in here where you can email me directly. If you go to the About tab in this, in this app and you scroll down a little bit, this email us your feedback, I read every single one of those. That goes to me and my wife. And if there's something in there that isn't clear or if there's something that, no, I'm serious. Like reach out to us because there's someone else that probably had the same question and I want this app to be foolproof. So use it and then if you run into difficulties or anything, like, please let me know and we'll make it better for you. But that's the goal with this app is I, I, I believe this world can be a better place if more people grow food. And, and I spent the first 30 years of my life learning how computers work and the next three learning how plants work and I want to put them together now and do something with all this energy that wakes me up every morning. So instead of just worrying about the world, like I did that for too long, I want to do something about it. So is there like an ideal space in your, if you have a regular backyard, is there an ideal space in your... I would say there's ideal spaces because every plant has its own things it likes, right? So okra can take as much sun as you give it. So if you have an area that gets all like full sun, put okra there, put basil there. Like those things can handle it. But there's other things that like a little bit of shade in the afternoon. So put those on the east side of your house. And you want to identify different microclimates in your yard. And why, that's all that means. Yeah, so I have stuff all around my yard because I'm taking advantage of different spots. I have some that get shade in the afternoon. I have some that are full sun. Some that are all shade because lettuce is only going to grow in all shade in June. And even then I'm pushing it. So... So you just want to identify the different areas of your yard, then use our app to see what likes those areas, and hopefully we'll do a better, I mean, that's something we want to do a better job of is helping you recommend so you can filter down to just shade or, and you can see what grows well in that area. We'll be adding a lot of things to filters, um, hopefully soon to, to show that, and to show what I mean, this filter right here. We'll be adding things in there like shade and full sun and stuff like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. and front yard and west. So is there like a prime time to consider it getting a full sun for a plant? Six to eight hours in Oklahoma. Six hours in the middle of summer is enough sun for anything. Um, even tomatoes, which are technically full sun, will like some shade in the afternoon. Now there are some things that you can throw as much sun as you want, like okra, like I mentioned, watermelon, squash, 
those things, you can throw as much sun as you want at it, they're gonna be fine. But, but for the most part, most everything is gonna benefit from a little bit of a break in the afternoon. Um, just because it's not only so hot here, but there's also the wind. So the plants are being battered from, from all different ways. Cool. Well, if you have any other questions, we have a Facebook group too. You can join and ask questions or post them on our, on our page or uh, send us an email, how, however you want to send it to us. <laughs> we'll hopefully get them answered. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Thank you. Don't forget your seeds up here if you didn't get them already.